Thanks for coming. Thanks for uh, bringing me into your home, bringing us uh, into your home. We know it's not the same as being able to join us in person. So if you get a chance to do that, please do come. Uh, we would love to pray for you specifically um, and as a group and worship together with you. But but we understand that some of you need to stay away because maybe you've been exposed um, to COVID recently or maybe you've got some symptoms or uh, you're just in a vulnerable population. We totally get that. And we're just going to keep coming to you like this as, as much as you need. But we would encourage you to register for a service at issaquah.cc. Just come on and join us there. There's all sorts of things you can do on our website, including give, connect, care. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, as we come to our budget year close here at the end of June, uh, we certainly need your gifts to try to become uh, to come up to that level of of meeting all of our our budgetary needs. But uh, we'll we'll leave that to you and the spirit to decide how and when you should give. But we're so thankful that you've joined us. Um, there's lots of good stuff going on. Um, youth group is going on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. We'd encourage you to do that. Uh, women's Bible study starting up um, this week at on Tuesday and Thursday. So there's opportunities there. Reach out to the women's page there and the teens page on our website. We just encourage you to step in. Um, today, as we go into a time of worship, I, I really want you to get your bodies involved. Um, if that's standing or kneeling or um, singing loud, I would just encourage you to take take a posture today that just says, Jesus, I need you. We're desperate for you. Life hurts. This is tough. We need you to just pour yourself into us. But let's take a posture of openness as we sing. Um, we'll, we're going to sing a song. I'm going to come back with our, our second part in our series in the book of Acts, um, moving through the end of chapter 1 today. And then we'll take communion together. We'll sing again and then say goodbye. So stick with us. Uh, we hope that God just richly blesses you during this time. But we know this is only part one. Part two is to, to make a connection with us as a church so that we can encourage you on the road that you're on specifically.
is none beside you. You open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Have you ever felt this way? Jesus is coming. Look busy, right? Keep, keep moving. Uh, you know, look, look like you're doing something. Uh, when I was in my first full-time ministry job as a youth pastor, my office was down the hall from my boss, the senior pastor. And um, I, I remember one time early on, I was um, reading my Bible and praying at my desk. Um, not probably because I was super spiritual. I was just <laughs> like, oh God, I need your help, right? Uh, and he actually said, I don't pay you to read your Bible and pray at work. That's something you need to get done beforehand. And uh, whether there's sense to that or not, that was how I I, um, I started. <laughs> and it was interesting. His door was just down the office from mine. And his door would open and the door stopper, this old brass door stopper was loose and it would fall and they'd go click, 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 drag, right? And I would brace myself and look busy. Uh, and I know that that's normal in, in a lot of different employment, you know, things. But but for a, for a pastor, okay, I need to be in prayer. I need to be I need to be asking God about what's next. And I just, I felt this like urge. You know, I had several bosses after that. Several um, different offices. The senior pastor office had moved to another place. Other people had occupied that office over the years, you know, for 17 years. But that door stopper remained the same. And every time I heard that door open, I'd just get this little twinge. Of, <laughs> Jesus is coming. <laughs> Look busy, right? After all, didn't you hear this a long time ago? Jesus does not steer parked cars. God doesn't steer parked cars. Implication, um, you know, get in motion and God will direct you. Just start doing something. Look busy and then God can direct you. If you're just sitting in park, he can't move you, right? Okay, there, there's, oh, is that, is that? some sense there is that but is that really the right analogy because when the men and women of god when we look through scripture when the men and women of god did not know what to do they waited on god in prayer usually together so how do we then posture because maybe you felt this. Maybe you've mapped your Jesus life over the busy culture around you like I have. Okay, just gotta just kind of try to get through something. Maybe uh, get a little quiet time and get a little, little this, a little of that, a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of that. Whew. I, I know for me, when, when tensions are high in our home, and they have been for months, um, I usually get busy. Okay, uh, let's just clean something. Let's organize something. And then I usually find that Heather's right there with me doing the same thing, just cleaning, organizing. Um, I've just been a lot of time in my yard. Uh, you know, like I can I can try to fix that and get rid of those moles. And I can, you know, I can, there's something I can control and something that I can do. But um, I think what you'll see today um, in the church as it began to develop in the book of Acts is that when they didn't know what to do, they engaged in sustained, unified prayer. And they took a deep dive into Scripture to understand what they should do next. So let's take a look at that together. We're in Acts chapter 1. Uh, Jesus has just ascended to be on the throne, to run things from his overwatch position. He's, he's right there next to the Father and he's directing um, everything in, in his kingdom. Uh, and, and the people of God are waiting for the Spirit of God to empower them as witnesses. We looked at that last week. But now we're in Acts chapter 1. Uh, let's just look at the first couple of verses, 12 and 14. They went back to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, which is just very close to Jerusalem, about the distance you could travel on a Sabbath. So it's a short, a short pace. And they entered the city. 
Um, and the people we're talking about are Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew. You keeping track? James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. That's 11. And they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. They all gave themselves single-heartedly to prayer with the women. So the 11, with the women, including Mary, Jesus' mother and his brothers. So Jesus' mom and his brothers are there with the other women. And they're engaging in single-hearted prayer, or as I was saying, sustained, unified prayer. That's a big principle. John Polhill says, There's no effective witness without the Spirit. We learn that. Wait for the Spirit. And the way to spiritual empowerment is to wait in prayer. To wait in prayer. And so here is where God likes to sit his disciples. The disciples of the Son are waiting, hoping in prayer. That's their posture. And Luke uh, mentions that the, that the women are there. He's, he's writing and said the women are there. And he's probably the same women that he had mentioned at the end of Luke, uh, his first volume, uh, the female disciples, those who, who had loved and followed Jesus and, and supported his ministry and were healed by him and were transformed by him and were forgiven by him and so engaged in this. In fact, we're the first witnesses of the resurrection. Isn't that interesting? And here we have Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary, the long-suffering, patient in prayer. The, the woman who stood by at the execution of her son, weeping, aching, heartbroken, yet hopeful, working hard to apply the promises of God to her situation. But God, you said, but but when you, but you said this would be the way it goes, and, and, and how does that fit into my life right now? Moms, you, you know what I'm talking about, that working hard to apply the promises of God. Moms, actually, would you take notice of Mary? She's your mother, too. Spiritually, she's your mother, helping, helping you understand how to engage this brokenness. And she's here in, in the book of Acts only one time. Only one time, and, and, and she, she was present in the beginning of, of Luke's gospel, and there was a, a, an amazing work of the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit overshadowed her. And now she's here at the waiting, and the Holy Spirit is overshadowing them, and there's a special work going on of the Holy Spirit in this time. And so that's, that's what we all should be. And the brothers are there, the, the, the women, the, Jesus' mother, and the brothers, the brothers who were hostile to Jesus's ministry, right? But here they are, right here, called followers now. Can, can you imagine how Mary's heart ached for her other kids to know what she knew? Mary, did you know? Brothers, did you know? No, they didn't. They did not understand what was going on in, until they did. And so uh, here's just a word to birth mothers you know, and, and adoptive mothers, spiritual mothers, mothers of all types. Um, your patient, long-suffering tears, your prayerful tears are noticed. An another famous mother is Monica. Maybe you don't know this. But it doesn't really come out of our tradition, but, but I've studied this a bit more. And, and I wonder if you know the story of Monica, the mother of St. Augustine. Now, Augustine um, is one of those few saints that all Christian tribes agree on. You know, back in the, back in the day, back in the 300s, um, you know, we, there, there was a, there's divergence, right? But we all agree on this one guy, Augustus, St. Augustine. But when he was in his teens and 20s, he was throwing away his life. And his mom was trying to turn him to Jesus, to understand Jesus. Uh, Monica was in a, a, an abusive relationship. Her, her husband was a not, not a believer and, and an, an abusive. Um, but she would be praying and praying and praying for, for her husband and for her children. And, and Monica would follow her son <laughs> where he would go in his career. And through tears that only a mother can shed. With anguish that only a mother's heart could really know. And Augustine actually talked about this. He says this, I cannot sufficiently express the love that she had for me. 
nor how she travailed for me in the spirit with a far keener anguish than when she bore me in the flesh. Think about that. The travail of childbirth. And he says, oh, it, it was more intense, her, her prayer and her, her tears over me spiritually were far more um, powerful than, than even just the travail of, of childbirth. And, and all the way along, as her great son says, Augustine says, the Lord's ears were open to the cry of her heart. To the cry of her heart. One time, Ambrose, uh, the Bishop of Milan, that's where she had followed her son to, told her this, speak less to Augustine about God and more to God about Augustine. She took that advice and, and stopped trying to convince her son out of this heresy that he was in and this wayward lifestyle and began to speak to God more about Augustine and, 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 in, and in tears. And he said to her, because she, she would weep in the church and just weep over her son, and, and he would say, it cannot be that the son of those tears should perish. And what's interesting is that Augustine would call himself a son of tears, a son of tears. And in the Catholic tradition, which I'm not a part of, Saint Monica is the patron saint of mothers and fathers and of all lost and wayward children. Mothers take heart. Mary is there with Jesus's brothers. And if you're not a mother or father and, and you're trying to figure out your role in this, remember that Jesus redefined family, didn't he? He said, who is my mother? Who is my brother? He redefined motherhood and brother and sisterhood um, as those who do the will of God are my family. So we see the church entering into this sustained, unified prayer, this prayer that, that brings the church together, that brings them, aligns them under God's provision and and allows them to, to move forward, to do the will of Jesus, to really become that full family of God. Because Jesus is the king, he's in charge, and we're his family if we do what he says, and so we wait on him. Okay, let's go to Acts 1, 15 and, and following. So it says around that time, Peter stood up in the middle of the gathering, um, which by this stage numbered about 120. And he says, my dear family, the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David, about Judas, who became a guide to the people who arrested Jesus. That was the betrayal, right? There it is in the Bible, and it had to come true. He was counted along with us, and he had his own share in the work we've been given. I just want to pause here and, and, and pull out a, a principle here. When they were trying to make sense of Judas, they, they took this deep dive into Scripture. And it's just curious that there was 120, about 120. Well, 120 is a very Jewish number, a very good Jewish number. Uh, an official Jewish group would have 12 leaders and 120 people, like the 12 patriarchs, you know, the, the children of Israel and, and the 12 disciples, right? So there's a sense of completeness there. But, but without Judas, how could they model and symbolize God's plan for Israel and then the world if they're one patriarch short of a true Israel, right? <laughs> they're just, they're a little bit, so, so they know this because Jesus told them there's going to be 12 thrones and, and you're going to sit on, my, on the 12 thrones. And in the Revelation, we see that there's going to be 12 thrones of the kingdom of Israel and the apostles are going to be seated on that. So there's a sense of completeness. And so Peter leads them into this deep dive into scripture to explain the Judas story. He goes on in verse 18. He was counted along with us and he had his own share in the work we've been given. And Judas, you see, had bought a field with his own money, with the money his wickedness had brought him, where he fell headlong and burst open with all his innards gushing out. This became known to everyone who lived in Jerusalem so that the field was called in their local language, Akeldamach, which means blood place. For this is what it says in the book of the Psalms, let his home become desolate and let nobody live in it. And again, let someone else receive his overseeing task. Judas has become this, this picture of betrayal. And how do we explain this? How could this possibly be in God's plans? And here's something that maybe you know just intuitively, that betrayals require explanations and we want to get them from God. 
A betrayal requires an explanation. Like, what is going on? How did this person turn on me? How did my child turn on me? How did this all happen? I need to know what's going on. And does God have any perspective for me? And so the question for me is, is for you, are you pursuing God's explanations for the betrayals that have happened in your life? And are you aware that he has experienced betrayal at a deeper level than, than you have? Can you find him in the midst of that and, and say, what is your perspective? Because the Jesus family, like every family, is going to experience tragedy, uh, death, betrayal, but hope and faith right? It needs the Spirit's power to see uh, the change in life. It needs something supernatural. God, do a thing, do a work, do it again. Like Mary, like Monica, like your mom, like my mom. We look to Jesus, 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 Jesus. Would you bring the hope of the resurrection, the new creation, the power to actually transform lives? Tom Wright says this, um, he says, we'd better get used to this theme of God's plan overruling complex and problematic circumstances. Because for Luke, the idea of God's providence still at work, even though things may seem sad and dark, is extremely important. God takes, has a way of overruling these dark and difficult circumstances. And so we wait. We wait for him. He is good. He is gracious. Now, Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed, was placed in a scriptural context as a tool of the enemy of God. And then he's to be replaced by one who will be an instrument of righteousness, a witness to the resurrection. In the last bit of this passage, 21 and following, says, so this is what has to be done. Peter's still talking to this group. There are plenty of people who have gone about with us all the time that our master Jesus was coming and going among us, starting from John's baptism until the day he was taken from us. Let one of them be chosen to be alongside us as a special witness of his resurrection. So they chose two, Joseph, who was called Barsabbas, with the surname Justice, and Matthias. Lord, they prayed, you know the hearts of all people. Show us which one of these two you've chosen to receive this particular place of service and apostleship from which Judas went away to go to his own place. So they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was enrolled along with the eleven apostles. So it's showing us that as an apostle, being a sent one, uh, one a disciple who's now an apostle, the main task is to bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus himself. Right? This new creation has begun. And if we, if we don't see that in the book of Acts, then we're, we don't have anything really. The resurrection defines the church. Way back then and now. Tom Wright continues and says, uh, The church is either the movement which announces God's new creation, or it's just another irrelevant religious sect. Yeah, that's it. It either is bearing witness to God's new creation, actually showing it off as the new temple space where heaven and earth meet. Or it isn't. And the stakes are high, aren't they? But I love this. One of the things they prayed, they, they prayed to God, the knower of hearts. What do you think about that? The knower of hearts. How awesome is that? There's really good advice here for you, uh, for maybe you who are learning how to pray, learning how to wait, learning how to, to bring out the, the depths of your heart to God. Don't try to be fancy in your prayers. Give him your heart. Pour it out. Pray it out. He's the knower of hearts, yeah? He's the knower of hearts. God, you know my heart, so I'm not going to posture with you. God, you know my heart. You know it's broken and and I'm, I'm experiencing the depth of pain that I've never felt before. God, you're the knower of hearts. And so I just lay myself out before you. So they prayed to the knower of hearts and they rolled the dice. Or they, they pulled a, a, a stone or, or a, a die out of a bag or shook it out until one fell and the lot fell to Matthias. You know, so it's really interesting. But they decided between two good options, right? It wasn't like... Uh, Oh, if God wants me to rebel against him or not, I'm just going to roll the dice and see what happens. No, not, not at all. And interestingly, this is the last biblical account of people rolling the dice or casting lots. Um, you know, a man 
casts his lots, but the Lord determines the outcome. Proverbs 16, 33. But we don't see that much more. And in fact, from this moment on, Willie James Jennings says this, uh, from this moment on, um, every common thing of the disciples of Jesus, every administrative act, every bureaucratic gesture, exists in the posture of waiting and stands in the shadow cast by the Holy Spirit and within the necessary work of prayer. So, so that's, that's a, big, a big statement for, for each one of us, and certainly the leadership of our church. Are we steeped in prayer? Certainly for our church as a whole. We haven't been in sustained, unified prayer, right? We, we need to be. We need to be. Not just busy. We need to be in sustained, unified prayer. Uh, that's that's going to be essential to discovering God's heart. And, and of course, a deep dive into Scripture to get his perspective on what's going on in the world and, and how, how do we experience all this. Personal loss and betrayal, but then also as a, as a group, as a family together. And I've come to appreciate prayer uh, a lot more since those early days of believing that I needed to look busy because Jesus is coming. So I have some questions for you. It's actually more of a true or false. True or false? The kingdom of God is advancing with force against the kingdom of darkness. True or false? Yeah? The kingdom of darkness, for the moment, holds most of the world in its clutches. True or false? Do you believe that? Does it shape the way you pray? Does it Shape the way you interpret unanswered prayer. Because we're in the middle of this struggle. So if we are indeed talking about the overthrow of the kingdom of darkness, and all authority has been given to Jesus Christ, and we're in this story now, we're in the book of Acts, and and Jesus is reigning through his people, and Jesus must act until he has finished vanquishing evil, if that's what we're talking about, then, then we're in the midst of a, of a big struggle and, it, and it's so important for us to be prayerful. Okay, another true or false. The Lord of the angel armies and all his forces, angelic and human, are now in the throes of bringing his enemies under his feet, taking back ground, storming the beaches, raiding the tunnels and the caves, right? Bringing about his kingdom. True or false? If this is the case, then Jesus has left us in the game to grow us up. To grow us up. To prepare us to rule and reign with him. Those 12 thrones over Israel in the new creation are only the beginning. That's just over Israel. There are a lot more nations and tribes that need kingdom leadership. And guess what? Lean in. You're invited into the throne room as a type of apprenticeship. Even right now, you're training to rule and reign. You're invited into the throne room as a type of apprenticeship. John Eldridge uh, says in a, in a very inspiring and helpful book, Moving Mountains, he says, Effective prayer is far more a partnership with God than it is begging him to do something. A partnership with God more than it is begging him to do something. So God, what are we going to do about this situation? What are we going to do about this wayward child? What are we going to do about this brokenness in our families? What are we going to do about this issue in our church? What are we going to do about the brokenness in our society? What are we going to do about this? In the throne room, in our apprenticeship to Jesus, the King. Right? As C.S. Lewis says, he seems to do nothing of himself. God seems to do nothing of himself which he can possibly delegate to his creatures. He commands us to do slowly and blunderingly what he could do perfectly and in the twinkling of an eye. Creation seems to be delegation through and through. He offers that to us. Last true or false? God hears us when we cry out in our distress 
and he is moved to act. Do you believe that? The Psalms are filled with this emotive praying. Uh, I cried out to God and for help, and I, heard, I, I cried out to God to hear me when I was in distress. I sought the Lord. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and, and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? So as we think about sustained prayer and a deep dive into Scripture, doing that together as the family of God in order to really understand his purposes and have him comfort our hearts, I want to just ask you this last question in closing. Do you come to prayer knowing that God is already expecting you, looking for you with longing. He is our Father. We are his family. He desires us to be drawn into him. Don't just get busy. Wait on the Lord. For a time of communion, I want you to think about the fact that Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, had already made plans when they sat down for this Passover meal. They sat down, and Luke describes this in Luke chapter 22. He says, When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with them, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So he's look, anticipating the, the, the reach of the kingdom of God and, the, and all that needs to take place until then. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that now, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Until it comes fully. And we can participate now. He took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe, to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they all asked, who could this be? And of course it was Judas, right? But he offers to you, and I want you to take seriously this moment, do you offer your allegiance to Jesus in the new covenant right now? Is that your, is that your offer? Because we wouldn't drink this cup if we were betraying Jesus, right? So we open ourselves to him and say, Jesus, we accept, we drink this new covenant, which is in your blood. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you'd lay down your life, that I would be set free. sing for all that you've done for me.
who brings our chaos back into order, who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory. The King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. sing for all that you've done for me. All that you've done for me. Well, that's it for now. But I'm so encouraged that you're hanging in there with us online. Again, uh, join us uh, in person as soon as you can. Uh, we would really love to be there to encourage you. I'm fully vaccinated, so I could give you a hug. You know, I, I, we, we love you. We care about you. Um, we hope that you're staying healthy. But, but hopefully we're, we're asking mostly that God would just conform us to his character. That he would shape us. That we would wait in the presence of God, not be hurried, not trying to get a little bit of something from Jesus, but to, to be enveloped into his life and develop those patterns together. So if you need some people around you, which you do, don't try this alone. Following Jesus is not a solo adventure. Um, we got small groups for you, kids ministry stuff for your kids and youth ministry. We're ready to, to wrap around your family and, uh, and see what God brings through you as well. So join us. We love you. May God richly bless you until we meet again. Just to
favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you 